Okay, this is an interview. It is the 26th of January 2012. It's a home interview at 26 Maxwell Lane, Cambridge, New York. It is approximately 1.15. Um, the interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your, we're going to do two brothers, identical twin brothers today. Um, could you give me your names, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Michael Sobing, date of birth is 122.48, place of birth is New York City. Okay, John Sobing, also 122.48, and also born in New York City. <laughs> what was your educational background before going into service? Mm, high school graduate. High school graduate also. Okay. Did you enlist or did you, uh, were you drafted? Drafted um, February 28, 1968. Um, Enlisted for March 1968 in, while in the service. <laughs> okay. Okay. Did you both receive a draft notice the same time? Yes, same day. Same day. Same day. Wow. Hmm. Okay. Um, what branch of service did you go into? U.S. Army. Okay. U.S. Army. Uh, where did you do your basic training? Fort Jackson, South Carolina. All right. What kind of training did you receive? What do you remember from your basic training? Uh, it was very different from what I expected it to be. It was harder, both mentally and physically. Um, it was long and uh, at times gruesome and grueling. <laughs> now, were you both in the same basic training? The same, in the same, same unit, in the same platoon, and everything. Alpha Gators, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, Tank Hill. Hmm. Hey, now, how did your family feel about you both going together? Well, we didn't have that much of a family. We just we lived with our mother, mm -hmm. and the other family was kind of separated from us. And you know, she just said, "It's better if you go together." And you know, you know have some little something yeah. there, anyhow. Did you request to be together? Uh, not originally when we were first drafted, but then uh, when we were gone overseas, we, we did. All right. All right. Where did you go after your basic? Uh, How long was your basic? In eight, 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 nine weeks, I remember. Mm -hmm. um, then we went to, uh, well, when I said I re enlisted, we, we, we gave them another year to add a program where if you gave them another year and you qualified, they would send you to school. So um, we, we decided to take the, um, that option and uh, went to school at Walter Reed for a veterinary specialist, which is a 91P20 MOS. So how long was that program? Um, I remember, I think it was about six to eight weeks. What were, what were, could you describe the program? It was so some of the medical training in a veterinary field to become a veterinary specialist, which means that what you would do is basically take care of army animals, um, provide them with medical care, things like doing lab tests, giving shots, providing emergency care, assisting at surgery, uh, working in clinics, uh, all the basic nature. support for any... Um, Sentry dogs. You know. It was good training. A lot, a lot of good medical training. Mm -hmm. It was based on like a college program. I think our class is one of the first ones to go through this program. And it was based on a college course where they had academics and they had practical work along with it. So they taught us uh, everything from giving shots to doing lab tests to um, dog handling and various other skills that, that you would need to, to function in that particular job. It was a very specialized job and it was a new program and um, I thought it was really a training. Now when really you went, went to Vietnam, as, you went as dog handlers? No, I went as a 91T20, which is a veterinary specialist. Okay, um, do you think the program prepared you for what you encountered out in the field? Yeah, I, I think it was, it was, it was a very good, good program, yeah. educationally. It, it was surprisingly yeah. good. It was taught by veterinarians, so it was very practical. They gave you a lot of hands-on work. Um, they had a big research 
center there at Walter Reed where um, they could provide you with a lot of good experience, everything from the lab all, all the way through the practical work. And, and um, it was rigorous. I mean, you were tested both um, academically and, and, and practically. But um, I, I felt they did a real good job. Now, how long was that school? If I remember, it may have been t t two months, ten, ten weeks to two months, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. Now, were you promoted out of that school? Um, I think uh, PFC. PFC from that, from E2 to PFC when you got out of school. Okay. Yeah. Well, what did you do after the training? Uh, well, after, right after, um, we got our orders after school. He got orders for Vietnam. I, I got orders for Okinawa. They gave us uh, 30 days leave, and then we were supposed to ship overseas. Oakland, California. Yeah, and when uh, we got to Oakland, uh, I got the paperwork and told them I wanted to volunteer to go to Vietnam because I figured going there anyway as soon as they mm -hmm. sent him back. So I had to sign a, a, a waiver which absolves the military of any uh, any liability in case you know you don't make it back. So you sign a waiver and um, it was very simple, and that was it. And we said, okay. You can go to Vietnam. <laughs> so. so did they assign you to the same unit as John? Um, actually, they they did. Um, they did assign us to the same unit. They assigned us to the 97th MP Battalion, uh, the 91st Military Police Company Sentry Dog, which was headquartered in Cameron Bay, and they had various detachments throughout the um, Central Highlands. And they had a, a big big kennel up, up in Pleiku, so they, they sent us both up there. Now, did you go directly from California to Vietnam? Directly. But from um, SeaTac, wasn't it, or was it Oakland? Oakland, Oakland, Oakland. Oakland. came out of Oakland when we yeah. went over there. What were your impressions of the first time you landed in Vietnam? It was <clears throat> hot and humid and funny, you know, because one thing I really remember was all the smoke coming up, you know, and the black smoke and everything, and everybody on a plane was all nervous and everything. I thought, well, you know, it's, it's, it's artillery or mortars or something coming in, blowing everything up. So we got on the ground there, and they unloaded us. We found out they were burning crap. That's <laughs> what all the smoke was. <laughs> So it was, it was different. Yeah. Wayne, Wayne can relate to that. And you have that <laughs> smell, that smell when you, it's yeah. all over. Yeah. When we got to the 90th replacement battalion, um, Long Bin, I guess it is, they, one of the first things we did was we got detail for, for shit burning. <laughs> <laughs> so that was an interesting detail, you know. Just pour this stuff over there. It's real easy. <laughs> it was easy. It was easy. Better you know, so than KP, you know, something like that. Yeah. Did they ever confuse you two guys? <laughs> um, not, you know, not really. Um, they, they, they were kind of stunned, most of them. You know, they never saw anything like that. You know, a lot two of brothers like, together. <laughs> I don't know if some of them. Most of the people seem to be okay with it. Mm -hmm. you know. Occasionally you run into an officer or an NCO so kind of look like, how do you do that? Or, or whatever, <laughs> you know. It's, but it was, it, it generally was pretty well accepted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long were you in each one of these posts? Uh, well, we were, um, our main post was out of Pleiku in Central mm -hmm. Highlands. Yeah. But we also did other things. We went to other places like On K, went to Quignon a couple of times, uh, then we to it. You know, different detachments that they had, either delivering dog food or checking on other, you know, facilities and see what they were doing. Or, that was it. We went to um, Camp Inari, which is 4th Infantry Division sometimes, yeah. out in the, uh, out, uh, south, I guess, south of Pleiku. Mm -hmm. We knew some some of the guys who worked over there were in our class, so we used to go with, with the veterinarians out there and, and work with them sometimes. And, but mostly it was, a, it was a military police company, which was a sentry dog company, uh, as opposed to 
the other guys, a lot of them worked in scout. They group. mostly have shepherds? Actually, they, they were mixed up pretty right. well. There were some breeds that I don't think you could identify them. They were like shepherd mixes or, or, or mixes of a, but they all had all to be, I think, big. 100, 100 pounds, pounds, 100 pounds. Minimum pounds. weight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and they were all trained on Okinawa. Right. And they were trained on Okinawa. They were assigned a handler. And then they were shipped over to, to Vietnam, usually to Cameron Bay, and then they'd be shipped out from with there. the handler to whatever detachment that they, they would work in. And what we would do is uh, take care of those dogs medically. We had over 60 dogs in, in a new kennel that they built. Just, just for, it was built right, right up on top of the hill. You could look out from the kennel and see almost all the way to Cambodia. And uh, so we would take care of these dogs medically and give them all their shots, check their records, um, do whatever emergency care was, was needed. Um, all the lab work, uh, keep all the records, and we worked with a veterinarian who was not assigned to the MP, he was assigned to the medical detachment, and he would work with us um, to take care of the dogs. Mm -hmm. How'd you get along with him? Wonderfully. He was great. Good. They were all, mm -hmm. all the veterinarians were real easy to, to get along with. We really can't say that for the military police. Um, <laughs> they were a lot better than so many other people we had to <laughs> deal with. How did you carry weapons at all? We had, they issued us 45 caliber pistol, which basically stayed in the arms room. I, I never took it out <laughs> for, for any reason. But we, we had M16. We had, we our own we had mm -hmm. a, a lot of weapons. Yeah. Different. M16, but a 30 ever, caliber carbine. Did you ever have to go out into the, the field itself? Uh, uh, it, like, not on an infantry patrol. We mm -hmm. used to go out to the to the um, ammo dumps and whatever to, to check on the dogs and all um, out to the post sometimes if something happened or, or whatever but it wasn't like you were a, a scout dog walker or anything like that you know you didn't yeah. walk point or anything mm -hmm. were uh, what were some of the diseases that you had to bear with the dogs were there any exotic Everything, right? everything, all kinds of parasites, hookworms, every, everything under the sun. And there was one disease over there, IHS, they called it, immune deficiency syndrome, yeah, it, yeah. infected the blood of dogs. It was a bleeding disorder, and they had no idea where it was coming from or what mm. was causing it. And some of these dogs were contracting it, not, not in our kennel too much, but in other ones. And they were sending them back down to Cameron Bay, and a lot of them were... Dying. You know, not making it. The idiopathic hemorrhagic syndrome. And that's why they, they would not ever send a dog back. Because they didn't want to spread that. Mm -hmm. What happened to the dogs? They'd be euthanized. Yep. Or else if they died from the disease, that was that. You know? hmm. yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of rabies. Yeah. There was wild dog populations that used to run around the ville and outside. And it was, they could be 10, 12 15, 20 dogs to a pack, and they're wolf and rabid. Uh, it was a big problem over there. Did they, uh, did the civilian population kill them for food at all? I never saw that. I don't know, but all, uh, I don't know if they did or not. Uh, that was a rumor, but I don't know if, if mm -hmm. that ever, ever happened. I mean, these packs were pretty, pretty tough. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't do that. As I recall, all the dogs over there had their, their tails always yes. kind of, Yes. Curled, was that just uh, a quirk from seemed, that part of the world? It seemed to be. I, I saw a few that, that didn't have that, but we had a mascot. Its name was Bear, yeah. and it was what they called a goof dog. It was yeah. one of those dogs, yeah, he was, mm -hmm. and he used to hang around a kennel. And he did have that curly tail, and he was a weird-looking brown dog with little, kind of looked like a chow. Yeah, like and a he was a bull tough, tough, little, tough little guy. And he didn't like Vietnamese people very much, they least. so they had a ceremony to, you know, ordain the kennel, so to speak. And they had Vietnamese come up, big wigs, the general and his daughter. General. Well, he bit the daughter, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he took off running. <laughs> and he, look, he took off because they were after him. Mm -hmm. but 
Not our guys went after him. <laughs> no, he didn't, he didn't endear himself to anybody on yeah, that day. Luckily, he didn't have rabies or anything. <laughs> we did have an incident of rabies, though. Yeah. There was a, a puppy that they brought into the kennel. One of the guys brought it in. And every they were all playing with it and everything. And it had been bit by a scorpion. Hmm. So it was, it was one leg was all swollen up. And uh, it died. And subsequently... You know, John and I kind of looked at him and said, well, we better check, check them out, <laughs> you know. So we packed them up ice and sent them off to the lab, and they did a necropsy on him, and he was rabid. Yep. He was rabid. So all the guys in the company <laughs> had to get the old series of rabies really? shots. Oh, yeah, really? Or, you know, in those days, it wasn't so pleasant. You know, it was a, a, a series of, of, I think, 13 or so shots Gosh. around the belly button. And it was really unpleasant. We didn't make their lives any better. 30, mm -hmm. 30 or so people had to get these shots. Because mm. everybody petted the dog. Yeah, they all, they all had saliva. saliva or, or, you know, it's, yeah. it's in saliva. So if you got a nick on your hand or anything, yeah. you can get in there. Hmm. Were you ever under fire? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of mortars and rockets and, yeah. you know, some... Probes, probes fire. not so much probes, but occasionally you get ground probes. Uh, they never really amounted to that much. We got a lot of mortar and rocket stuff, mm -hmm. especially around the little. What town. were your living facilities? Um, well, live? we actually lived in the up in the kennels. Just me and him had our own little hooch up there, where we could, you know, get to the what dogs. Was it a we, tent or no, no, we built it ourselves. Oh, we got some. Wooden plywood and stuff from some bartering that we did for hmm. ammo and stuff, and we built our own room up there. It was a part of the kennels that was left unfinished, so they said you guys could finish it, and you know, so we we built our own room, and that, that's what's where we stayed. It's yeah. it was pretty nice, so we were right there at work if we needed. If something happened, we could be right there. Mm -hmm. Nobody bothered you. The MP officer didn't come up there. Yeah, or, you know, interesting. In the mm -hmm. so you didn't have any idea what we were doing, so we pretty much left to do our jobs on our own. What about details like KP or no details ever? Really, the last detail I ever had in the service was in basic training KP. After that, I never had another detail. Wow, well, not one. <laughs> I was You're lucky good. at that, you know. Well, I, I we learned a system too, you know. <laughs> when we were going overseas before we got there, um, we had to go for some interview or something about him signing up to go to Vietnam. So they gave us a paper, you know, excuse from details and everything. So they wrote it in pencil. So we went to the interview and got all of that over with. Next day we just changed the date, erased it, and changed it again. <laughs> so if anybody said anything, I go, no, 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 we got to see Captain here. <laughs> no detail. <laughs> so, you know, there's a system there. You got to learn it or else you're, um... What kind of food did you have where you were? In overseas? Well, where you were in your, did you have hot meals? Did you use Oh the, yeah, we, we had, race, um, race we had Camp Schmidt, which was uh, in, in Play Coup, outside of Play Coup. Um, actually an old French facility from, yeah. from their years in Vietnam. So they had a mess hall type of thing where they had food, you know, it wasn't the greatest food in the world. There was flies and stuff swimming around in the drinks and you know, they had some of the Vietnamese um, working there, and you never knew what they were doing if they were checking a place out or, uh, you know, doing their jobs. But yeah, but the, the facilities were good. We we had one of the few places in Vietnam that actually had flush toilets and showers because it was left over from the French. The MACV headquarters was up right behind Camp Schmidt. Um, just north of Camp Schmidt was Camp Holloway, and there was old um, stone watchtowers and stuff that the French had put up, and so on. And, and that there was, was Artillery the... Hill, just north of that. A uh, big prison of war camp was right down the road. Martin Yard Village and across, across the street, the street so right behind us. A lot of things. It was an interesting place to be. Yeah. The thing was the toilets, they always... Uh, Malfunctioned they and kind of backed, backed up, up so you'd have about a foot of sewage in there sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> it was not real good. <laughs>
Did you ever run into anyone with drug problems while you were there? Drug problems? Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh plenty, yeah. plenty of problems with, with, with drugs. Uh, some problems with race, some problems with drugs. Uh, Regular crime, sloshing, mm -hmm. uh, there was murders. Mm -hmm. They used to bring all of the prisoners through the, through the um, facility down there, and they'd come through the, the mess hall, the mess tent there, and they'd have them strapped up, you know, with the chains around the waist and on the arms and on the legs and everything, and they'd have an escort with them, taking them wherever they were going to go, LBJ, Long Bin Jail, taking them back to the, to the U.S. for the, where they incarcerated in Leavenworth or something. A lot of drugs. They gave out some pretty bad sentences <clears throat> too, you know, hard <throat> labor and life and stuff like that. So it wasn't great. Yeah. Hash, a lot of a lot of drinking, you know, typical stuff. Typical military. military stuff. And one incident that was particularly interesting when I was I was down in the in the hooch for the um the dog handlers and we would you know, drinking a little bit of some Puerto Rican guys. We're drinking some rum and stuff, you know, they got from home. So we were sitting there one night just hanging out, you know, and one of these, they had an infantry barracks right next to ours. And in the back door comes this, this I say he was, he was a black Afro-American guy, very dark skin, had seen him around plenty in the place. He was known to be not particularly friendly. So he came in the back door, and he had a grenade with the pin out. And he says, I'm going to waste all you motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we're just sitting there looking at him. And luckily, I was sitting there with two Puerto Rican guys. And they were, you know, black skinned, mm -hmm. you know. And I was friends with them. And they talked him out of it somehow. He stuck that pin back in a grenade, and he left, you know. But I think he was going to do it. You know, if it wasn't for those guys being there, he was, he was a drug abuser and heroin and angel dust and all that crap, you know, and he was pretty damn high, I guess, so. Hmm. Now, Mike, in your forum you said, I did not find military service to be inspiring. No. What do you mean by that? Um, I did I didn't find it to be something that showed me the better side of humanity. Um, it, it, it showed me, and I guess this is a valuable lesson, you run into a lot of people who, who don't have your best interests at heart, um, who are dangerous, nasty problems, and, and you have to learn to adjust to it's not like civilian life, you know, where, mm -hmm. where people put their arm around you and say, okay, Mike, it'll be okay. And there's nobody there to do that. You have to learn to function in a world of, of, of reality. And it mm -hmm. takes you out of your little dreamy place and puts you in amongst them. Um, you got to swim with the sharks, you know. And a lot of people you watch your back all sharks. the time. Watch your back, you know, both from top and bottom. So I didn't find it to be inspiring in, in that there was a lot of heroism or there was a lot of and you know, just guys trying to do their job and you know, stay alive. What were some people that you remember best from your service? Mm. Uh, <clears throat> from basic training it was I think the sergeant's name was Sterling Stewart. He was a platoon sergeant in basic training. Very great guy, you know. I mean he could be rough and and tough and mean when he had to be. But other than that, if you tried, he saw you were trying, you were doing your thing, he would always help you out and he would be very good. Yeah, mm -hmm. Myers. Myers was another one, Sergeant Myers. He was in basic training. I remember one time in basic training, I had, they had given me boots that were just a little bit too big and they had a seam in the back. And I had blisters in the back of my heels, like the size of a half dollar. And they used to bleed. And they used to rip open all the time. And we were running to the um, rifle range, I think it was. And oh, they were terrible. They were, they had, I was bleeding out there. And he was good enough. He said, "Okay, you just walk the rest of the way. Make sure you catch up." And he was good that way. You know, if he saw you were making the effort and everything, he wouldn't. He wouldn't screw you. So mm -hmm. in that way, he 
he, he was a he was a good guy, and he's one of the, one of the few I ever met in in basic training who was who had any any sympathy. <laughs> Not a place for sympathy. Let's <laughs> <laughs> put it mildly. But my my heels did heal up after basic training. We had a lot of incidents in basic training. We had um, I don't know if you ever saw that movie Full Metal Jacket, and that um. One guy who went nuts, um, he shot him, platoon sergeant, and he shot himself. He had an incident very similar to that from a guy named, I forget his name, Remick or something like that. And he was a guy who never should have been taken into the service. You know, he was a, a problem case from the beginning. So uh, he was uh, not treated well by all the members of the cadre and by the other people in the platoon. So uh, one night he tried to burn down the barracks. He set a fire in a latrine there and everything and paper and all that stuff. He was burning it down. So of course they didn't appreciate that too much. And they gave him a blanket party, which you probably know what a blanket party is, where they throw the blanket over the guy to cover him up and they have all kinds of stuff in these socks. Just like in that, that movie there, you'd think it's something that was, you know, glamorized in Hollywood, but it actually did happen. And they wailed the tar out of this poor guy, and they wouldn't stop. So I had to snatch up one of them guys and choke him out to get him to stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I witnessed that. What happened to the guy afterward? You know? uh, he, he, uh, he was subsequently uh, arrested, taken away, and I don't know, maybe he, I, I could only I speculate as, as to what happened to him. Mm -hmm. What happened to the guy that, that, that John took care of? Well, he put him in a full Nelson, put his head down to his chin, and dropped him, and that was the end of it. But this guy was a little background on the guy. He was a overweight Jewish boy from New York City who had no business being in the military. And from day one, he was in way over his head. He was doomed, you know? But I think he wound up going to jail. I don't know what they did to him. Or else they dishonorably yeah, discharged him or something. But, you know, it's, it's like unbelievable. You see something in the movies and you say, well, that don't really happen. But it does. Well, did you ever get to any of the cities on leave, or do cities on leave? Well, uh, I got to Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. Which was well, okay. How about when you were overseas? Did when you... I was overseas, like an R and R. Never got it. Never but said that MOS was critical. Too critical. So never got out. Really? A whole year, never got out. Wow. Couldn't go. Um, I got to Saigon, Matrang. Leku, Anke, Quignon, and various other locales around the Have you ever, ever eaten any of the local foods? Uh, once went down to the Ville in, um, must have been Camon, yeah that, yeah, that little fishing ville, yeah. yeah. Yeah, had a soda, big mistake. Didn't feel good for a week. <laughs> I mean, I think they really just emptied them and refilled them or something. I don't know. <laughs> But um, yeah, that was the only only thing I, I ever ate there, and no. never eat anything else again. No, and that cured me from eat, eating any of the local food. <laughs> Besides, I think they used human fertilizer there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the smell of it, you know, you could, so, <laughs> you know, you're probably not getting <laughs> a good dose of uh, some. Kind what about of uh, <laughs> USO shows? Did you see any of those? Never had them up there. No, yeah, the little the little, little shows ones. like. Uh, they, like they Korean come, bands and that? Yeah, come to the, Filipino, mm -hmm. and then they'd come to the enlisted man's club or whatever, and there was several of them. But they never had a big one. They didn't like to have them up there for some reason. I don't know. I don't, I don't, didn't want to take them people up to you. So you never saw Bob Hope and no, his entourage? Never saw, no, <laughs> not close. No, <laughs> no, we never saw any, any of them. I don't think they... Central Highlands, I don't think we're that popular for that sort of thing. Um, it was less of, I, I didn't see even 
any news about anything might I'd ever come in a whole year. Mm -hmm. So I think they just didn't, didn't like it. Did you ever have any contact with any of the Vietnamese units at all? The soldiers? Oh, yeah. I saw them the sometimes. Soldiers. We used to be on the planes with them, the caribou with the with the uh, mountain yard troops, you know, carrying M1s and BARs and World War II weapons and yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, when we first got into the country, they put us on a plane flying us up to Nha Trang, I think it was, and uh, it was a C-130, I think it was a caribou, maybe it was, yeah. yeah, but it was filled with Vietnamese soldiers and we were all crammed in there with them. They had chickens and they had their rifles that were bigger than them and all, and uh, we also had that big um, POW camp, which was right on the highway, mm -hmm. right, and we used to ride by there all the time. And I think we got a picture of one of them. We used to, you know, wave to them. <laughs> they would wave back, and they'd be squatting there in their you typical know, that Vietnamese mm -hmm. way, yeah. you know, whatever they were doing behind mm -hmm. the wire and all. So, um, and we we had a lot of Moffat nods up there, and we had some contact with, with them. Uh, they seemed to be fine. They, they were all pretty good, really. You see them on the road. Were there many special forces units in that area too? There were. Yeah, there were. Uh, special forces all around Central Highlands, and we also took care of a special forces dog who was shot by, I think it was a shotgun, yeah. mm -hmm. and he brought him into our place, and he was, um, had a lot of holes in his back towards his rear end, mm -hmm. and you could look right down in there and see his um, spines and hip bones and everything, and it was infested with screw worms, fly so, larva. Oh, really? Fly larva. Little white worms, yeah. real disgusting. And actually, <laughs> you think it was a bad thing, but it wasn't. Probably saved his life because they, they only eat dead tissue. So they kept the wound pretty clean. And so eventually, when it cleaned up, we had to take all the screw worms out of there and pump them full of antibiotics and dressings mm -hmm. and everything until we got the thing to, to eventually heal. And they, you yeah. know, they came back and they, they took them back. We had gave some liquor to the to um, our commanding officer there, that yeah, white guy there, yeah. and uh, yeah. we didn't get any of. It. He, he took it all. He it didn't all. do jack. <laughs> he didn't know how to do jack. Mm. <laughs> so um, we had Australians. We had some Australians around us, Australian troops, and and uh, various other ones. Some Koreans. We saw North some Koreans. Koreans uh, you know, it was on that road to An Kei, that Min Yang Pass, they had a, a jeep there, a Korean jeep that had been, I don't know, hit by a B-40 or something, and they just left it there. You know, everybody, every time you go down there, you look at it. <laughs> so, oh, well, <laughs> too bad. How long were you in Vietnam? One year. One year. Where'd you go after Vietnam? Walter Reed. Uh, Walter Reed. You went back to Walter, Walter Reed. Reed. I liked Vietnam much better than straight side service. Why? Nobody bothered you. At least in my job. Yeah. You know, we, we had our own cooch there. We had our own weapons. We had our own jobs. We we, we did our jobs. They left us. They basically left us left us alone. You know, we um. We basically functioned independently of, of 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 the military as much as possible, and uh, it was it was good. We you had your own jeep, you could drive around. Uh, we used to drive around, take pictures, and do various things when we had a little time off, and uh, so it was uh, it was very interesting. I I, I had her three years, and I spent in service. I take that one year, you know. With the bad stuff, that way I could have done that for three years and been very happy. Did anybody bother you about uh, haircuts or polished boots in Vietnam? Very occasional, not not much, mm -hmm. um, not much in in play coup because it, it was a detachment. It was out away uh, from, from from the main, and they had that red dirt that it was all mud, mm -hmm. you know, and the monsoons. I mean, what are you going to do? You can't shine your shoes like a waste of time, you know. But once I had to go to Quinyon, which is all sand over there on the coast, so I had to 
go there and I went there and some guy sees my boots, you know, which weren't exactly spick and span, and he says, you know, yeah. I says, well, where I come from, we don't do that. <laughs> and he says, oh, okay, just don't let the first sergeant see you. I liked, I, I liked that service better than came back to um, Walter Reed, um, worked in the um, research department at Walter Reed. Um, they have a large veterinary research facility there out in Silver Springs, Maryland, Forest Glen they called it. They did all kinds of research on diseases that came from, guess where, Vietnam. Uh, all these different infectious diseases, diseases from wounds, and this translated over into the, um, in, in, not only into the veterinary field, but, but also in, into the medical field where a lot of these wounded people were coming back with, with inf infections that couldn't be controlled. And uh, so they were doing a lot of experimentation on animals to, to try and get a handle on, on all this stuff. So big facility, they had plenty of investigators, I worked in the Department of Veterinary Pathology, making slides out of tissue samples for um, veterinary pathologists to look at and determine the um, diagnosis of these various things. And believe me, there were a lot of them. Hmm. Uh, they take si tissue samples, um, cut them into small pieces, float them on a, a little stream of water and then you take a slide and a paint little paintbrush and put them on a slide and they'd be stained in various colors and different things would take different types of stains so you make a slide out of it go to the pathologist he'd look at it under the microscope and by the color and the shape of the cells and all the things he could determine whether it's a certain type of cancer whether it's a certain type of infectious disease or or, or whatever hmm. and, uh, so that, that wasn't too bad a job either. It was pretty, pretty nice. Mm -hmm. And I worked in the subhuman primate division, which is basically apes, <laughs> different kinds, but mostly it was rhesus monkeys. And uh, we had to medicate them and take care of them. They would be subject to various experiments, which I didn't particularly like, but that was what they gave me to do, so I did it. And we had to catch them. They had them in these, like, these squeeze cages, so you had to squeeze them up and get their arm and reach around and grab their head and pull them out and hold them so the person could tube them, put a tube down, a nasal tube down mm -hmm. and press antibiotics into them because they had a lot of intestinal issues and stuff. But I mean, it was probably as dangerous a job as Vietnam because these monkeys were filled with all kinds of diseases. Yeah. And they said, if you ever got bit, you know, you had a good chance of... Uh, yeah. Not making it. They had Seriously. monkey B and they had all kinds of Bee. intestinal stuff mm -hmm. and everything. So it was a very interesting job. But I never got bit. I learned how to have fast hands. Once I you got never gave gloves or anything. Kind of I mean, we had gloves, but these monkeys uh, they were like regular work gloves. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they even made it harder because mm -hmm. they'd get slippery or it wasn't like chain mail or nothing. Or nothing's gonna keep you from getting bit. One time I got scraped on a finger just a little bit, but I never got chomped on, you know, where they, where they really bit into me. Yeah, they, these things like got teeth, you know, they have canines mm. that are that long. And they're tough and they're strong. You know, you could have a little monkey this big and he's as strong as you are. Mm -hmm. so they had chimps, they had baboons, they had rhesus monkeys, they had little, little monkeys, they had beagle dogs. They used to bring in hundreds hundreds of beagle dogs on trucks and they would use them for all kinds of medical experiments. You'd see dogs walking around with electrodes yeah, like sticking out of their yeah. heads and everything. Mm -hmm. Stuff that a lot of people don't know even goes on. The military mm -hmm. doesn't even do, but they, they do it and they do a lot of it. Some of them, once we had a, a big rhesus monkey, he must have been about this tall, he had a head on him like that canines, you know, like uh, mm, down here, and the guy, <laughs> the officer says, uh, get him out. He was in a big squeeze cage. I looked at him, I says, I ain't getting him out. So I had to go in and get the tranquilizer gun, you know, which was a long gun like this. I'm there trying to 
Bing, and he's jumping around, bing, 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 bing. I got one shot. I guess I was lucky. Bang, I got it right in the butt, you know, right in the thigh, off the thigh. And he went down. So I lifted him out. I says, okay, now he's out. <laughs> but I'm not pulling him out the old-fashioned way. So, hmm. so that was kind of funny, but, you know, I just arrested him. I thank my lucky stars that I didn't get assigned to the monkeys and the chimps. <laughs> I did, but once I got her dead, and they can't do anything to you. Jeez. And it was, uh, it was how, long, how long were you there? Around a year. How many other enlisted guys worked with you? Um, quite a few, actually. This is a big facility. There were enlisted army, and there was a lot of civilian workers yeah. there. Uh, most of the, a lot of the guys who worked with the chimps and the monkeys and all were animal handlers yeah, like that actually GS, GS number something or other, and they worked there too. There was a lot of of. Uh, different experiment. They would come from all over the world, these guys, to do these experiments at, at Walter Reed. It was actually quite quite a mecca for that sort of thing. Uh, we used to see officers from Greece, all, all different parts of Europe, Asia, Filipinos, and, and they were all involved in this medical research. So it was a really big deal at the time. And it probably did a lot of good, saving a lot of people you know, from What's the good facility is still running? It's gone. It's been gone for years. I know the, the main Walter Reed is closed, yeah, and right. I, I'm not sure when they closed the, that facility, mm -hmm. but I'm sure it, it, it's mm -hmm. also gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, it may have been moved to Fort Detrick or something. In the, I don't know if you've ever read the book, The Hot Zone. I haven't. It was a book yet. about the Ebola virus and the spread of the Ebola virus, which is theorized to come from elephants or monkeys or, or some primates or an African. It's, it's, it's one of the most unstoppable, deadly viruses on the face of the earth. And in the book is mentioned 91T20 MOS, because guess what they had down there? They had Ebola, <laughs> which is something you never wanted to get out. So they had a lot of these quarantine areas in there where these big different viruses were. and. Uh, and they, they did have Ebola, which is incredibly dangerous because there's no cure. And it is, once you get it, you're, you're done. And nasty uh, way to go. It comes from mm. Africa. And it comes from when the, when the person dies from Ebola, the Africans have funeral rites that they grow through washing the body and all that. Well, the one who does that gets the Ebola and then transfers it out. And they thought, you know, it was a primate disease. So it, it was... Uh, like I said, it was more dangerous than being in Vietnam, being in Walter Reed at times. It was, it was, it was really, uh, could be a little disconcerting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. When were you discharged? Uh, discharged from Fort Wadsworth, Staten Island, um, 3 March 71. Right. That's where, I, that's where we spent the last eight months of our service. Was, uh, Fort Wadsworth, Staten Island, worked at the veterinary clinic located right underneath the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. <laughs> hmm. yeah. Was that an experimental station? Too? No, that was no, a that clinic. Was regular. That was a veterinary yeah. clinic for military pets mm -hmm. and. Um, they did food inspection we, also. We did food yeah. inspection. We did um, missile site. Yeah. Sentry dogs for missile sites. Oh yeah, which are a lot of them in New Jersey and in those days. Long Island, you know, real interesting. Got to go down in a silo and hmm. to missile and all yeah. the electronics and everything. Climb down a ladder and looks like a regular, like a block house, you know, made out of cinder blocks. Nothing special. A chain link fence around it. And you go in and you go down and is down there. I don't know if they still keep them there, but. They were there. Hmm. What rank were you guys when you were discharged? Specialist four. They didn't have, um, I think that's as high as they went for that MOS at the time. Maybe five. Maybe they are going to have five, but the only way they would give you a, a five is if you re-enlisted. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't going to happen, so. Did you ever make use of the GI Bill? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, sure. Went to um, college when I got out. And we lived on Staten Island, got a AA, went on, got a BA, and then 
got a master's degree after that in a different field. So. Yeah. You used, used, used to the whole GI Bill all the way through as much as they would give you. Mm -hmm. I think it was in those years like $270 a month for full time. Well, you had to do something because there wasn't any jobs. It was like it is now, you know, except the different interest rate situation, but the job situation was pretty much the same. There was nothing. Did you ever use it to buy a house or anything? Yeah, actually we did. Way back when uh, on Staten Island, we, we, we bought a house uh, with, with my mother and uh, yeah, we did have one of those type of uh, loans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we we used it. it was, the GI Bill was it was good. It was a, a a savior for guys getting out of the service at that time because there wasn't any jobs. I mean, mm -hmm. even uh, worse than now, I think. Yeah, I think it was worse than now. And uh, yeah, as far as the employment situation was, and at the same time, the city university was free tuition. I think there was a five-year window where, where the tuition was free in the city university. Mm -hmm. So. With that and the GI Bill, we could, you could yeah, get a college you could work education. Work on the side, mm -hmm. you, know, you know. We had our so own little business good. and stuff, and we had enough to get by. Do you think so, you guys would have gone on to college had it not been for the GI Bill? Uh, probably the opportunity would not have presented. I, you know, I thought about it often before I went into service, and could never quite, you know, with working and everything, find a time or whatever to do it. Um, no, I think that. That that was the uh, yeah we didn't come from a college family or anything mm -hmm. and nobody in our family ever went to college we were the first ones you know so it wasn't something that was thought of as what you do you know yeah. mm -hmm. that was like Ivy League the college was a place that had that ivy on the walls and stuff like that mm -hmm. and we didn't know any, have a clue about that so <laughs> did you run into the protesters at all <laughs> when you were discharged uh, yeah a little bit. Uh, on, on a plane coming back from, actually not from Vietnam, it was from SeaTac over to um, Chicago, into, or to Chicago and New York. Um, we had the, the, the uniform on and uh, I don't know, somebody said said something on a plane, some some guy, but they just quickly dismissed him and that was that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. But um, and some other guy bought us a drink, so so it was balanced. It was balanced out. Mm -hmm. Never saw too much of that. No. Even Living on Staten Island was a fairly conservative community, so they didn't have as much of that as um, maybe in some other places, like mm -hmm. if you're in Greenwich Village in Manhattan mm -hmm. or something. So you ever ran into it on campus? The students actually no. Um, it was it was. Very good <clears throat> atmosphere, even for, for veterans. There was a lot of veterans. There was quite a few um, guys. Even wore their old fatigue shirts and, and everything mm -hmm. to to college. And there, there was abs absolutely no no problem. There was nothing like that. In and some classes, there would be discussion about mm -hmm. stuff like that, but mm -hmm. it was never like um, really acrimonious or anything like that. It was just. Some kid would say something, another person would say something, and yeah, you know, know somebody would mm -hmm. say, "Oh yeah, they defend the servicemen," and mm -hmm. it wouldn't go further than that. You know. never, never really Which was good. Too I mean. much of that yeah. kind of thing, yeah. you know. Now, do you have any photographs you want to include in this that you can show us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mike, ask them about the barber. They've got to tell the story about the barber. Okay, While barber. you're looking, could you tell the story about a barber? Oh, the barber. We had a barber in, in Camp Schmidt who, who was kind of a famous barber. Everybody would, would go to him. He was a little little Vietnamese guy. And he used to do the thing where he would they'd crack your neck after they, I think they were all chiropractors or something, <laughs> or would be chiropractors. But they would, they would crack your neck uh, afterwards. And, and sometimes they'd do it quite forcefully, you know? And he used to do this for everybody, and he, he even did it to me, and I didn't really like it. Though. So the next time he told me, he said, don't, don't crack my neck, you know, no, no. <laughs> and, uh, so we had that mini tet there, and, and they had a, 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 a ground probe, and uh, guess who he found in a wire? 
He's the Bob. Yeah. So he he was uh, he was retired. He was retired by that time. So I think maybe he was he was practicing. You know, he wanted to go a little further, but he just couldn't quite have the uh, guts to really crack somebody's neck. Here's a they shoot him right there. A couple of pictures from uh, when if you, he first got to be. If you hold them up right in front of you, I can zoom right in on them. Now, who is who in the pictures? Mm, good question. Uh, this is me and this is John. I'm on the right. John, so then, well, that's John. No, that's John. <laughs> <laughs> now, both those pictures are identical? I think they are. Where were, where were they? Where yeah, were we they got three of them, actually. I was taken in camera on very when we first got to yeah, when got we first got got Vietnam. You can see the, the chain link in the back. That, that, that's the back of the kennel. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's a, a genuine army issue sentry dog, <laughs> right there. And I don't know because he ha he probably has a muzzle on, which I hope he does. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this was a picture of me and Mike from that book they give you about your service uh, in Vietnam. Uh, can can, can you that hold that up straight? Now, wh where are you guys? Uh, here. That's you. And here, this is Mike. Mike. And, and if you the look other? at the, oh, okay. yep. at the names, it's fairly interesting. This book was made by Vietnamese. And they couldn't figure out our names, so they made me into John Joe, John <laughs> J.O., <laughs> which is an oriental thing. And he was just spec for Mike. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was me. Spec <laughs> for Mike. <laughs> that was, they were confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they were very wrong. confused by that. Interesting. Okay, got it. Very interesting. And I got a picture in here of our, um, just kind of a bunch of pictures of our detachment. Just off Fort Jackson infantry training and book. Yeah, boy, that was a cork. Okay. Okay. So this is actually the kid that I was sitting with when the guy came in with the grenade. That kid, yeah, he, he was a, a Cuban, I think he was. Yeah, he was a Cuban. Okay. We drank rum with him, and then that, that guy showed up with the grenade and ruined our evening, to say the least. But, you know, that's the way it goes. Do you have any photographs on this album? Yes, yeah. Look on, see which one you think of. This is just planes and medevac helicopter. This is downtown Pleiku. We always see that sign. That sign is in that movie there. That, oh, so that one about the Marines and yeah, um, it is. with that way and all of that. Now, is this you or any of you? Well, that's me. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's me or John. I don't know. That's what's left of uh, the barracks after they hit it with a 122 Rock, millimeter rocket. One of them, that's in Flaco. Oh, after a rocket attack? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It's rocket, a, more some guy's something. bunk kind of guy. Yeah. I don't think he was in it, though. Okay. Did you guys take a lot of pictures while you were over there? I got this, you know, not too many. Yeah. Did you have a good camera? Or no. No, I had whatever it was borrowed no. or something from somebody. Inst one of those Instamatics. It, it worked. You did that digital? No, <laughs> in those <laughs> days. <laughs> There's another picture of the rocket attack in the mortars. You see how it this busted is it. The it's a sentry door. Yeah, the black one is Baron. His name is Baron. Yeah. I it took a, me a long time to get to be friends with him, but finally. You did. Make friends with some of them. Now, who is this with the grenade launcher? The That's me. That's right. If you look closely at the top okay. of Baron's head, it kind of comes to a point. Well, his handler had a particular way of disciplining his dog. He would take his helmet off and dock oh. it on top of the dog's head when he didn't. So we had to counsel him to stop doing that. He developed a cyst. He developed a cyst on top of his head, which kind of made his head come to a point. He looked like an above. That's Mike. Yeah, the Baron. That's me. That's Mike, I think. This is Jed. 
This is Mike. It's Mike. I think and over here we got a picture of the, this lieutenant we had that came later, and he's having, you know, a tussle with the dog. They were doing some training. He's got the, the arm, okay, sleeve on, so he doesn't get chopped. Lieutenant Overman. Okay. Yeah. It was almost private. And we got a captured weapon, SKS rifle. Now what did you do with that? Did you have to turn it in or no, we kept it. Couldn't bring it home. They wouldn't let you it's hard to bring so anything we like that. Somebody else so we left so. and just passed uh -huh. it on, you know. And um Washington yeah, DC. Another picture of a rifle and that's that was um Basic training. All oh, the basic training pictures there. Graduation. Oh, here's the camera right here. Picture of it. Yeah. Before they built the new atmos. Okay, got it. There's the uh, panel right there. That's a picture of it from one end. Right there in the bottom. Mm -hmm. yeah. and it was funny, they came and built these um, revetments around okay. a panel, which were about three foot wide, four foot wide, and filled with dirt and sandbags and stuff on the top. But when they built them, they built them around the dog area only. So they left our thing completely <laughs> uncovered. <laughs> so you know how much we were <laughs> thought of. <laughs> It's all just kind of funny. I thought. <laughs> the lieutenant you see there in that picture, Overman. Well, he came. He replaced a a, a particular captain named uh, McCloskey, who was um, the one person in the service that I absolutely hated the worst. Um, we had more than words. Uh, several times, and um, we almost came down to it, except for um, a first sergeant who intervened, probably saving his butt, uh, and Overman replaced him, and Overman had the, um, I don't know where they got these guys from, he had a canister of pink riot gas, which he was fooling around with. Which he discharged, which through the prevailing winds carried pink riot gas down to the MP headquarters, enlisted man's club, and various other structures, which were full, which were emptied out <laughs> quickly and rather seconds. <laughs> and after which, during the investigation, which was rapid, everybody came up the hill <laughs> looking for the and yep. the man who discharged <laughs> it. <laughs> so we took the canister, to, give me that canister, and we shoved it underneath the dog food, way in the back where nobody could find it. And when they, they looked, tried. believe me, they looked, they went crawling in everywhere, <coughs> but they weren't crawling in there. So he was saved. <coughs> we saved his butt. And uh, the rest of the time, that he was the commanding officer of our platoon was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so he was uh, saved from, from uh, whatever they would have done terrible, to him, but it wouldn't have <laughs> been great. I don't think he would have been a lieutenant anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, if they didn't, didn't reassign Captain McCloskey, I, don't, I think I would have been a, and he won, and he would have been a, whatever they do to officers. Yeah. Yeah. So like I say, sometimes it wasn't inspiring, and sometimes it's okay. okay. This All right, um, we've got three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. What do you have? What do I have? Maybe I have maybe. something not from Vietnam. Okay. I have something I found in this book that I was just looking at. It's a picture from the Navy, U.S. Naval Training School from April 1945, the Bronx, New York City. 
a picture of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and an actual copy of this thing. So you might like this. It's all about Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Yeah. yeah. And it's right. dated 1945. Okay, well, thank you very much for the interview. Okay, you're welcome. Yes. I'm sure I could remember more. Yeah. Yeah. You guys did an excellent job. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, what about... Oh, wait a minute. Um, okay, we got two minutes. All right, what about dog handlers was unfortunately killed on the ASP ammo supply dump and plate crew one night during a rocket mortar and small arms fire and he was um, hit in the chest and it blew out his whole back so he was killed almost instantly and we had to go out and take him they had no medevac that night they wouldn't send it out so I had to take we had to take him over to the hospital 71st BVAC from, which he unfortunately did not ever return and he was a, a young kid he was married and had a wife and everything and so, you know, it was very nasty, and I think he had just, they had a program where you can extend for three months or something to get out of the service right from Vietnam. And I think he had just extended. It was his first yeah. day of extension. First day of extension. Mm. And that night he went out on post, and he did not come back alive. So he was he walking post with his flap jacket open. Uh, mm. And thing. And he was right amidships. And, got him and, and his dog had a... A wound with a piece of shrapnel went right through the dog's ear and left a hole about yay by yay. We had to treat that because we had to actually go out and get him and the dog and bring him back to the, to the kennel. So we treated the dog and there was nothing to be nothing to be done. They took him to the hospital, but it was way too late. Okay. Yeah. So that was um, that one of the worst incidents, you know, as far as that stuff go. Okay. All right. Thank, All right. You. thank you. Perfect. I think you were probably <laughs> thinking the same guy as I was in Long Island. The re-interview. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we did an interview with this guy in Long Island, and he kept saying he was forgetting things, and his wife kept talking.